Good evening and welcome to the History and Genealogy Virtual Classroom. Today is Tuesday, February 9th, and the time is 6.35. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly and I'll be moderating this Zoom series. Today's class, When is a Lutheran Not a Lutheran? A Brief History of the Evangelical Synod of North America, will be taught by Scott Hall. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on the library's YouTube channel. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. The instructor will answer questions at the end of this session. You'll find a link to the handout displayed in the chat screen. I'll now turn this over to Scott Hall and we will begin the class. Okay, welcome and uh, welcome to everybody. I appreciate you putting uh, where you're from in the chat that lets us know the kind of audience we're reaching and it's always interesting to see who tunes in. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Scott Hall. I'm manager of the history and genealogy department here at St. Louis County Library. And we're gonna talk about the uh, Evangelical Synod of North America, one of my favorite subjects. So first, I just want to give a sh shout out to this Tri-State Genealogical Society. Um, we, uh, 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 we are actually doing this uh, webinar at, at, at their invitation. So this is in conjunction with them. This is actually part of their regular meeting. Uh, so they were kind enough to let us open this up to the rest of the public. So uh, welcome to the Tri-State Genealogical Society members. And uh, please do check out their website. Uh, the web, web address is there at the bottom of the screen. So I also just want to plug our upcoming classes, which will be held also by webinar. Um, the question came up in the chat, do we record our webinars? And yes, we do. All our classes and programs are being recorded. And uh, so we have some uh, upcoming ones. Uh, feel free to register for these. You do not have to live in the St. Louis area. You do not have to have a library card, uh, just go to our website and sign up. The address is there or the URL is there at the bottom of the screen. So on uh, Tuesday, February 16th, we have a German one uh, of non-noble lineage, Deutsches Geschlechterbuch as a German genealogical source. And I will be giving that one. Um, next Monday, we will be giving uh, the, the, the third one in the, no, second one in the series of uh, our African-American uh, presentations, classes, Tracing Your African-American Ancestors, Advanced Techniques. Um, on Thursday, March 4th, uh, we will be doing a very beginning class, Who Are My Ancestors? Beginning Genealogical Research. And then on Wednesday, March 10th, we will be having uh, Finding Ancestors in US Census Records. So feel free to check those out. We have others coming up, so please check us out on our events page. Okay, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I am manager of the History and Genealogy Department here at St. Louis County Library, but I'm also part-time archivist at Eden Theological Seminary. That is a seminary of the United Church of Christ, and I will talk more about that uh, as we go along. Okay, so... Um, what I'm going to cover tonight is I'm going to give a look, uh, 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 kind of introduce the Evangelical Synod and its, its relationship to the United Church of Christ. I'm going to talk about the European background of the denomination, uh, early missionaries and the early history of the church, how it developed as a denomination. Uh, I'm going to talk about the transition into English and some of the, the things that led to that. Um, I'll review some of the institutions and missions of the denomination. And then, of course, you know, the title of this talk is, you know, when is a Lutheran not a Lutheran? And so I'm um, going to talk about just how Lutheran this denomination was, or was it? Uh, then I will talk about the kinds of records you can expect to find in congregations that uh, belong to this denomination, and then tips for finding them. Um, you know, this, this presentation will focus on history, but I will be discussing doctrine in here, here and there because you have to kind of know something about the doctrine of this church in order to understand its history and development. So what was the 
uh, Evangelical Synod of North America. Well, it was one of four historical predecessors of the uh, United Church of Christ, uh, which is a uh, mainline Protestant denomination here in the United States. So uh, one of the, the earliest uh, uh, historical predecessor was the Congregational Church. Of course, a Congregational Church that goes back to the Pilgrims, the Puritans, New England, um, a very, you know, kind of uh, New England American uh, denomination. Um, in 1931, they, the Congregational Churches merged with the General Convention of the Christian Church. The Christian Church was founded in the United States. It was founded by uh, pastors and members from various churches, mainly Presbyterian and Methodist and others, uh, Congregational. Uh, but they founded a new denomination, and this was in the late uh, 18th century. They emerged in 1931 to become the General Council of Congreg Congregational Christian Churches. Another merger, um, the German Reformed Church in the United States, or what became just known as the Reformed Church in the United States, um, that was founded in the 18th century. That was founded by the first wave of German immigrants. You know, there were two large waves. There was the 18th century wave of German immigration and the 19th century German wave of immigration. So um, we have uh, the, uh, and it was found, founded by German immigrants. Uh, and it was originally known as the German Reformed Church. Later they dropped the name German and just became the Reformed Church. It merged with the Evangelical Synod of North America. That's the denomination I'm gonna be talking about to form the Evangelical and Reformed Church in 1934. So these two denominations, the Congregational Church and or Congregational Christian Churches and the Evangelical and Reformed Church uh, started uh, talking to each other and that led to another merger in 1957 into the present day United Church of Christ. So that is just to give you some context for where the Evangelical uh, uh, Synod fits into uh, denominational history today. Okay, so uh, before we get into the history, I just want to clarify uh, the term evangelical. Uh, <clears throat> evangelical, the original meaning uh, is pertaining to or centered in the gospel. In the American context, it has the connotation of conservative or even fundamentalist. But in the German Protestant context, it just simply means Protestant. So any German Protestant church could adopt the name of evangelical. It just meant uh, not Catholic. So the Evangelical Synod was a denomination that was founded in 1840 and it uh, it existed until its merger with the Reformed Church until in 1934. It was unique among American denominations in that it merged German, Lutheran, and Reformed churches into a united evangelical church or a united German Protestant church. Um, you know, I, going back to the title of this presentation, you know, when is a Lutheran not a Lutheran? Um, and I, I came up with this title because this denomination is very often uh, confused with Lutheran denominations. Uh, the congregation, and, and there are a number of reasons for this. One is that congregations often identify themselves as Lutheran, especially in their early days, in, their, in the early history. Uh, many immigrants came from, uh, who founded these churches, came from Lutheran churches in Germany. Doctrinally, and in terms of their worship style, they were very similar to Lutherans. Uh, outsiders often identified themselves, uh, identified these churches as Lutheran. I mean, to many outsiders, especially, you know, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, German Protestants were just generally known as Lutheran, no matter what denomination they actually belonged to. So sometimes in the English language press, you will hear, you will find that these congregations are identified as Lutheran when actually they are not. So let's uh, delve into the European background a little bit. And this is gonna be very quick and sketchy, but I just wanted to give you a little background. So let's go all the way back to the Protestant Reformation um, in the 16th century. And there were actually two Protestant uh, reformations on the uh, European continent. One was beginning at, uh, in 1517 with Martin Luther uh, in Wittenberg and you know the 
<clears throat> story about him posting the 95 theses on the castle church door in Wittenberg. Um, but there was also another um, reformation uh, and that was the reformation that we called the reform, what became the reformed church. And there were actually two major figures uh, in this reformation. One was uh, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich. Uh, his work as a reformer began about 1519. And he was actually a contemporary of Martin Luther and they actually had some dialogue with each other. They actually met each other, uh, but they didn't agree on some things. Um, about a generation later, uh, oh yeah, and I might, I should mention that Ul Ulrich Stingley was, was uh, a German speaker. He was Swiss, but he was a German speaker. About a generation later in 1536, uh, Jean Calvin uh, began his work in Geneva and he was a French speaker. So uh, he was a, became you know, a French speaking Protestant. Um, so the, those two combined, you know, the Calvinists and the Zwinglians we generally refer to as the Reformed, um, uh, but uh, Zwingli was, uh, was German and had a little more influence on the German speaking areas. They also didn't necessarily agree on everything. They had differences of opinion also, um, but they, they worked together very well. Um, so, but that was not the case with, between the Lutheran and the Swiss reformers. There was a lot of division between the Lutheran and the Swiss reformers. And they could agree on a lot of things, but there were some very key things that they could not agree on. Um, uh, so, of course, this disagreement, of course, it, they were both against the Catholics and, of course, the Reformation politics and politicians and uh, kings and princes get involved. And so you end up, you know, with uh, wars, religious wars. The Thirty Years War actually turned, started as a, as a uh, religious war. It became a territorial war. It devastated a lot of Europe where the, where the fighting took place, but it ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. And part of that agreement was uh, reaffirming the idea that, you know, the religion of the ruler is the religion of the people. So, you know, who, whoever your king or prince or local duke was, whatever his religion was or whatever religion he declared for his realm, that was a religion you had to belong to. Uh, you were given the choice to move to a, a different area so that if, if you were Lutheran and you ended up in a Catholic uh, dukedom or, or kingdom and you wanted to stay Lutheran, you had the option to emigrate to a uh, Lutheran land. So by the end of the Thirty Years' War, you, you have uh, what, what uh, these uh, religious divisions that, I, that are depicted on this map, I've tried to outline uh, what be, sort of what became the, the German Empire of the 19th century in a uh, dark blue border. That's not entirely accurate, so don't hold me to this in terms of accuracy, but it gives you an idea of where the, German, the, the future German Empire was going to be. Um, so you see in the orange areas, this is where the uh, uh, Lutherans were. Um, in there you have, in the darker orange, you have in this area in Prat, which is Prussia, you have some Calvinists mixed in. The Netherlands over here, of course, are Calvinist. You have Calvinists or reform down here in the Rhineland area. Down here in Switzerland is heavily Zwinglian. And then the blue areas are Catholic. So this gives you an idea of the religious division of the German territories um, at the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1618. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, that's not, this is, uh, Thirty Years' War was later, I'm sorry. Um, so if you put an outline of modern day Germany over that, you can kind of get more of a context for where we're at. Um, so a couple other things I just want to mention that uh, in the European background is pietism. Pietism was a renewal movement within the Lutheran church. Uh, it began in Germany about 1622. So this was a reaction to a rigid intellectual Lutheran orthodoxy um, and to the devastation of the Thirty Years of War. Um, so after, after the Reformation, uh, 
you know, the, these uh, uh, re reform movements tended to harden and there was a lot of intellectual thought put into to them and, you know, defining, you know, who am I as a Lutheran or who, what is this church? What does it mean to be a Lutheran? What does it mean to be a Lutheran church? And uh, that was more codified and, and put in writing. And um, there were a lot of people who felt like this was becoming a religion of the head and that there wasn't any real spirituality to it. So or, uh, pietism was kind of a counter to this. Um, it emphasized personal faith in God nurtured by scripture, study, prayer, and service to the neighbor. And it incorporated the reformed concern that a Christian's life should embody the fruits of salvation. Now, that's not to say that that idea was not present in Lutheranism, but it, that was more of a reformed emphasis and one that was taken up by the pietists. Um, but, but the key point, at least for the history of the evangelical synod here, is that uh, piet the pietists believed that Christian unity should be based on shared faith in Christ, not on doctrinal agreement. And so um, they were willing to overlook you know, doctrinal disagreements um, and proclaim their unity in Christ alone. Another uh, post-Reformation movement was the Enlightenment. Uh, that, that was uh, kind of dominant in the 17th and 18th century or began in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, the Enlightenment emphasized human reason, freedom of conscience, and human accomplishment. Um, the emphasis on reason de developed into rationalism, in which reason supplanted religious faith as the chief source of knowledge. And so there was uh, a lot of people, uh, especially intellectuals in this area, who were abandoning religious faith. Um, rationalism began to in influence church doctrine and worship by the late 18th century. So, you know, pietism was a movement, rationalism was a movement. There were people who didn't become, you know, died in the wool rationalists or died in the wool pietists, but these were ideas that were in the area and they had influence, they had broad influence. And so there were people within the church, uh, clergy and intellectuals within the church who began to adopt more of these kind of rationalists, uh, rationalist thinking and applying it to uh, church life and doctrine. But uh, one of the things it did, I mean, for one thing, it removed more of the mystical or superstitious elements or suppressed those elements within the life of the church. But again, it de-emphasized doctrinal differences. And, uh, and so uh, it, it kind of paved the way for more cooperation between Lutheran and Reformed churches in Germany. So that brings us to the um, 19th century and King Friedrich Wilhelm III of Prussia, he ascended the throne in 1797. So Prussia was dominantly Lutheran, but the Prussian ruling house accepted Calvinism in 1617. So it, it led to this situation where you had, you know, the, the kings of Prussia being Calvinists or reformed, but most of their subjects were Lutheran, but they allowed their, their Lutheran subjects to remain Lutheran they, they did allow um, Calvinist or reformed refugees from uh, Catholic lands to come in and settle in Prussia. So there were uh, reformed churches in the Prussian uh, realm as well. Um, so uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's wife was Lutheran as well. And uh, he, uh, you know, would go to church with him and he, he always it made him upset because he could never receive communion when he went to church with his wife because of course Lutherans would not re, uh, would not allow reformed church members to commune at their altars so um, Friedrich Wilhelm was a Calvinist you know he was kind of frustrated by the Lutheran church and this division within Protestantism and you know being a king he just basically said well I can solve that I will just merge the Protestant churches in to, in my realm which he did beginning in 1817 uh, by founding the United Evangelical Church in Prussia, merging the Lutheran and Reformed congregations into one church body. So other German uh, territorial churches adopted this uh, same kind of union position as well. Uh, Hesse actually, that was going on in Hesse in one of the Hessen territories and actually started right before uh, Friedrich Wilhelm started his uh, Union Church. Uh, 
Um, I will say that there was a backlash against that, by the way, and the Lutherans really, uh, many of the Lutherans really rebelled against this forced union um, and uh, resisted this. And eventually uh, Prussia allowed the Lutheran churches to form an independent Lutheran church. Uh, so it essentially just created a third denomination. Uh, so they had a united church, they had the Lutheran church, um, and uh, of course the reformed churches were united in the, in the evangelical church as well. Um, so there, are, there were two kinds of united churches that emerged in the German territories during this period. There was a federated union in which individual congregations and pastors remained either Lutheran or reformed, but they operated under a common church government. So this was the case in Prussia. Uh, Lutheran churches, Lutheran congregations were allowed to remain Lutheran and call Lutheran pastors. Reformed congregations were allowed to be reformed and call uh, reformed pastors. Um, the other type was what I call synthetic union, where congregations and pastors were required to adopt or abide by a united confession that tried to reconcile the differences or, or minimize the differences between the Lutheran and reformed churches. So this happened a lot in the Rhineland areas uh, and in Hesse. So uh, in terms of this, in these synthetic, or in these churches that adopted a kind of synthetic union, basically what they tried to do is they adopted the uh, confessional standards of each church. So during the Reformation period, there were documents you know, that are known as confessional standards. They outlined and explained or articulated the doctrinal positions of their uh, Reformation movement. So for Lutherans, the main one was the Augsburg Confession um, and Luther's Catechism. Uh, these were two key documents in, in uh, the Lutheran churches. On the Reform side, uh, their confessional document, or they based a lot of their um, confessional writings on the Heidelberg Catechism. So these, these churches that came into a synthetic union or, or, or develop, uh, developed a synthetic union tried to uh, reconcile these, these two, these documents where they could, where they couldn't reconcile them. They basically said um, that it's up to individual conscience or the, it's up to congregations themselves to decide, you know, these issues where there are disagreements. Um, but these, these uh, churches, um, in fact, all territorial churches in Germany published their own catechisms. Um, and these, uh, these union churches also, uh, also published their own catechisms. Uh, most of the times they emphasized shared beliefs while uh, de-emphasizing areas where, they would where the two uh, Lutheran reform doctrines would come into conflict. So, um, Around this time in the 19th century, there are also uh, were, were uh, developed these German missionary societies. So if you are familiar with churches and denominations in the United States, you know that denominations do mission work. And so, you know, the Methodist Church does, they have their own, met, uh, own mission uh, arm of the church, you know, and they send out missionaries and so on. United Church of Christ does the same thing. Lutherans do the same thing. In Germany, churches were aligned with the state and the states, the state churches did not do mission work. Um, instead, there were uh, independent organizations that, uh, that took out mission work. They were independent of state churches and they were volunteer organizations and they were supported by uh, donations. So these developed during uh, the early part of the 19th century. They were themselves were products of pietism because one of the pietist emphasis was, was um, sharing the word of God to those who do not know the gospel. And so that naturally led to foreign missions and the development of these missionary societies to train missionaries and fund missionaries and send them out. So two of two missionary societies that were very important to the development of the evangelical synod was the Basel Missionary Society founded in 1815 and the Rhenish Missionary Society founded in 1828. So the Basel Missionary Society, as the name indicates, was located in Basel, uh, Switzerland. However, it was actually supported very heavily by uh, the church in Württemberg, the Protestant church in Württemberg. 
the reason being is that uh, they were afraid that Napoleon would in, in, invade, take over the churches and, uh, and suppress the Protestant church and suppress any seminaries that they would have there. And so they established this uh, mission society in Basel. You know, so it drew a lot of um, a lot of men, and they were all men in those days, from Württemberg who wanted to become missionaries, as well as uh, those from Switzerland as well. Uh, and then the Rhenish Missionary Society, was, which was supported by both Reformed and Lutheran and United Churches, or, or members of those churches. Uh, yeah, so both societies were actually supported by Lutheran Reformed Church members. So what these uh, missionary society, societies did is they tra trained men for work in foreign mission fields. Um, the Germans had um, mission fields in uh, the Gold Coast in Africa, um, in India, and other places. Um, they recruited and ordained candidates from lower social strata, in including farmers and craftsmen, and others. And this is an important point because in Germany, even today, how do you become a pastor usually? The normal course is you have to be university trained. The only way you can become a pastor in the state church, the territorial church, is to have a university degree and study theology. In order to study theology, the university usually had to come from the, the strata of society that um, supported going to the university. And so this was more the sort of what became the middle class, more among the intellectuals. Um, and not, you know, it was difficult for someone in the lower classes to kind of rise up to that level and be able to enter uh, university. So the missionary societies provided an alternative way of for men to become pastors. Because, you know, if you were a farmer, if you were a craftsman, if you were a, a teacher or tutor, um, a shopkeeper or whatever, you could enter one of these uh, missionary societies, you could study theology, you could uh, be ordained and be sent out as a missionary. So it, it, uh, it was a, a different way of getting into this profession. Um, the missionary societies, you know, they were not heavily academic. They emphasized practical ministry and service over in-depth theological study. And this is one of the things that sets apart the, these uh, missionaries from the university trained uh, clergy who served as pastors in the territorial churches. Um, university trained clergy, you know, were kind of steeped in theological study, um, whereas the missionary students were trained in kind of doctrine, but uh, didn't get heavily into in-depth study in theology. So Basel was, as I mentioned, very important uh, to, the past, uh, to the history of the Evangelical Synod. Uh, they, the, the Basel Mission Society sent at least 150 pastors to the US to become past, uh, pastors to American congregations. So that brings us then to the United States and to the early missionary work that was done here. So <clears throat> we are going to talk about the frontier uh, beginning in the 1830s, you know, this is when Germans started to flood into uh, the United States. So this was the beginning of the second wave of German immigration in the 19th century. So they were headed to the Western frontier. And of course, there were no German Protestant churches there to uh, serve them. So these immigrants, you know, came from these, you know, these territories in Germany, and they came from whatever the church was in the in their home territory. It could be Lutheran, it could be Reformed, or it could be United Protestant. When they arrived, the existing German American denominations were totally unprepared. So remember, there had been a, a earlier wave of German immigration beginning in the 18th century. In fact, there were Lutherans in America uh, in the um, 17th century, even. And uh, <clears throat> these early immigrants had created Lutheran and Reformed denominations. Well, so here we are 100 years later, and these uh, new immigrants are coming in. The established uh, American denominations, they have already assimilated. They're already transitioning into English. They're culturally different. You know, they're no longer really teaching uh, 
theolo theology classes in their seminaries. And so they just were totally unprepared for this huge flood of new immigrants. So when we talk about the frontier, or, or if we're talking about the West at this period, we are talking about places like Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, you know, Michigan, where some of the early missionaries went was still a territory. It wasn't even a state. We're talking in the, you know, 1834, 1836 is from when this map is from. So when we talk about the West in this period, this is what we're talking about. So, um, you know, like I said, Basel mission sent a lot of early mission, or so a lot of missionaries to the United States or a number of them. So the earliest of those was 1833 and Friedrich Schmidt came to Ann Arbor, Michigan. One of his tasks was to missionize or convert the Indians. But of course, when he got there, he found German immigrants. And so he started working with the German immigrants and um, creating uh, congregations. Uh, this was a story that was to repeat itself. <clears throat> um, also in 1833, there was a missionary whose name was Johannes Gerber. He arrived in Ann, Ob Ann Arbor, connected with Friedrich Schmidt, then went down into Ohio and then into Indiana. Uh, Georg Metzger also went to Ann, Ann, Arder, Ann Arbor, excuse me, and then down into Liverpool, Ohio in 1833. Then a little bit later in 1835, Johann Jakob Ries went to New Argyle, St. Louis County, Illinois. So he came from the Basel Mission Society, uh, but he came actually at the invitation of a, a group of Swiss who had settled in New Argyle there in St. Louis County, uh, or St. Clair County, excuse me, Illinois, right across the river from St. Louis. And then in 1836, uh, Georg Wall and Josef Rieger came to St. Louis as well. And then the Rhenish Missionary Society, that was the other one I mentioned, also started to send missionaries. In 1835, uh, Philip Jakob Heyer and Tilman Nies arrived in the St. Louis area. And then in 1836, uh, Ludwig Ed Eduard Nolau arrived. So the Rhenish missionaries had a, a different goal they were not, uh, uh, their goal was not to settle in St. Louis. Their goal was to continue on and actually to um, what is now Washington State to convert the Indians. But they got here, they got caught, you know, during winter, they got stuck um, and they ran into some difficulties. And so uh, they ended up staying here and uh, working among the German immigrants here. So I want to mention Edward Ludwig or Louis Nolau in particular, um, because he was very important in, in the development of the Evangelical Synod and can in some ways be considered his, its founder. And I will talk a little bit more about him. Um, he, like I said, he arrived here in 1836, but it, he started working among the German immigrants and there were a lot of coming in in, in, in those days into St. Louis, into St. Louis, what's now St. Louis County and into the Missouri uh, River Valley. And he started uh, doing work among them, helping to found churches, creating uh, preaching stations and so on. In 1838, he organized St. John's Church, which is now St. John's United Church of Christ in Melville, Missouri, just outside of St. Louis. Um, so now I will uh, talk a little bit about the denominational development uh, to about 1918. So as I mentioned, this was very much the frontier <clears throat> that these missionaries were encountering and the early, uh, or these uh, German immigrants who were coming in at this time. So some of the, the challenges that the pastors were facing was one, uh, imposters. So, um, you know, these, these German immigrants would come into an area, they would want to form a congregation, you know, church life was very important to them. And so once they got settled, many of them, the first thing they wanted to do was to create, a, to found a church. So if you have a church, of course, you need a pastor. You need a pastor to baptize. You need a pastor to administer communion, et cetera. And uh, so they went looking and there were, you know, America and the frontier was the land of opportunity. And you had all kinds of people coming over here. And some of them were just looking for opportunity. And so you had uh, certain German men who 
you know, maybe they have a little bit of education, maybe they have a lot of education, but they came in and they saw an opportunity. So they would come into a, you know, a, a group of Germans who were wanting to found a, a, a church or they, they needed a pastor and they would say, oh yeah, I'm a pastor, I can do that. You know, now, you know, remember there are no organized denominations who are serving these uh, immigrants. You know, they have no connection to a denomination. So anybody who's saying that they are a pastor can come in and talk about their qualifications and there's no way really to check them out. So you have these situations where these, these guys were coming in saying that they were pastors or saying that they were ordained clergy and just kind of, you know, kind of you know, bilking the congregations or just causing trouble and uh, were not very helpful. Um, these missionaries also encountered, you know, uh, the unorganized and challenging conditions of the frontier. So, you know, it was very unorganized. I mean, communication was dif difficult. Um, you know, uh, immigrants were, were living in oftentimes just rudimentary housing, log cabins. They were still trying to develop their land. Um, you know, they came from all parts of Germany. They, they spoke different dialects. So there were a lot of challenges in this period. Um, add to this hostility from old Lutherans. Okay, so I mentioned that in Prussia, when the King of Prussia decided to force a union between the Reformed and Lutheran churches, that there was a Lutheran resistance to this. And eventually Lutherans were, were allowed to pull out of the United Protestant Church or the United Evangelical Church of Prussia and, and create their own Lutheran denomination. You know, they were very much against, you know, one of the, their key issues was this forced union with the Reformed because they considered the Reformed heretics. And so these Lutherans came to be called old Lutherans because they wanted to ad adhere strictly to Lutheranism as it emerged in the 16th century and wanted nothing to do with Reformed. Um, so they they were able to create their own congregations in Prussia, but they were also, there were, were other territories, particularly in Saxony, Saxony uh, where they were having influence. So Saxony itself was a Lutheran territory, um, but the Lutheran or, or the, the Saxon uh, rulers were uh, entertaining, you know, these kind of rationalist ideas, which were leading to ideas like, um, changing the liturgy and uh, opening up, you know, church union with the reformed. And so there was also a, an old Lutheran movement in Saxony as well. A group of those uh, mostly led by uh, CFW, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Martin Stefan, who was a pastor in Dresden, came over with a migration um, and came to St. Louis. Many of them went de uh, farther down into uh, Perry County, Missouri and were instrumental in helping form what is now the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So it's an interesting development that <clears throat> these missionaries were coming into St. Louis, you know, who, who were coming from these missionary societies who were espousing this kind of idea of a united German Protestantism just at the time that these old Lutherans from Saxony were coming in at the exact same time who absolutely opposed these ideas. So once they got here, um, CFW Walter or Walter Walter, who was pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church here in St. Louis, um, published a um, a newspaper that was called Der Lutheraner, and was very published these very polemic arguments against these missionaries who espoused this union position. So they were very hostile. The, the mem these missionaries were just like, can't we just all work together? And the Lutherans were like, no, we can't, you know, and you, you know, you, you German church members out there, you know, do not listen to these missionaries. And if you're true Lutherans, you need to belong to our, our churches. So there, they were, there was this kind of hostility as well. Okay, on the other side, there were German rationalists known as the free thinkers who controlled the German press in St. Louis or and in other, uh, in other uh, uh, heavily German uh, uh, places. So 
you know, if going back, you know, I said the rationalists were, you know, many of them were really anti-religion. Um, they thought that religion was superstition, superstition. And so when they saw these missionaries coming in, they were, they really launched polemical attacks at the, these missionaries and uh, were very hostile to them and got people riled up against them. So uh, these, these missionaries had that to contend with as, as well. And then there were the German immigrants themselves. And so many of, many of these immigrants came in, uh, came to the, the American frontier and many of them were just happy to leave the church behind them or they had very loose or lukewarm connections to the church. Many of them had a lot of resentment against the church. Um, now in Germany, as I mentioned, you know, the pastors in the territorial churches were university trained, they came from a different class. And there was a big, oftentimes a large disconnect between uh, the clergy and the people that they served. And oftentimes um, the clergy were um, uh, not very helpful. I mean, in, in many ways, um, you know, there are stories where, um, you know, once in a while, if, if you're German and you start doing ancestry, it's not uncommon to come across an illegitimate birth in Germany. Well, it's because that in these German villages, you had to get permission from all kinds of people in order to marry. And sometimes this took years. And so the couple, instead of just waiting, just decided to go ahead with it. And uh, eventually, usually they did get married once they received permission, but, some, but you know, the clergy were part of that process. And, and sometimes the clergy held things up instead of facilitating things. So that's just an example. So uh, facing all of these uh, various challenges, uh, Louis Nolau decided to take the lead. He had become um, acquainted with a number of, of German Protestant clergy in the area. And so he sent letters to everyone he knew and said, let's to get together and let's meet and talk about um, how we can support each other in our work. So this led to a meeting in on October 15th, 1840 at the St. John's Church in Melville. Out of that, this group, and there were about six clergy present, uh, discussed <clears throat> these challenges and decided that they needed to create their own organization. So they created the Deutscher Evangelischer Kirchenverein des Westens, which translated into English is the German Evangelical Church Society of the West. Now note <clears throat> that it is, they did not call themselves a synod, which was a common German Protestant word for these kinds of organizations. Um, they did not, they did not want to uh, be viewed as a denomination because many German immigrants were very suspicious of organized uh, churches, of organized denominations, organized religion. So what they formed was basically a pastoral association where the pastors, pastors would work in mutual support of each other. They would, you know, could interview incoming clergy, you know, check on their references and make sure that they were qualified to serve uh, congregations, that kind of thing. Now, eventually, uh, congregations could become members, and uh, when they start holding regular conferences, they uh, welcomed lay delegates from congregations as well. So, as I mentioned, they, they consider themselves a pastoral conference rather than a denomination, and they organize for mutual support and to screen clergy for imposters. So, they also uh, adopted a doctrinal statement. So they adopt, they, their statement included uh, the Holy Scriptures as the word of God and the sole and infallible rule of faith and life. It's very common in these kinds of statements coming out of German Protestantism at the time. They also accepted the Augsburg Confession, the Luther's Catechism and the Heidelberg Catechism insofar as they agree. So if we remember back earlier in this uh, discussion to this synthetic union, this is what they were forming, a synthetic union of Lutheran and Reformed churches. So where they do not agree, they quote, adhere strictly to the passages of Holy Scriptures bearing on the subject and avail ourselves of the liberty of conscience prevailing in the evangelical church. So in other words, join one of our churches. You can be Lutheran, you can be reformed. You know, let's try to agree on what we can agree 
with and if there are things that we can't agree with. And I will, should mention that one of the major disagreements between the Reformed and the Lutheran churches in terms of doctrine was, was the theology surrounding um, Holy Communion. I won't go into all that. But where they, in this case, where there, there was disagreement, it was kind of lift, left up to individual conference, uh, conscience. They said, you know, study the scriptures and come to your own conclusion. Um, so as they got going, it was decided they needed to create some uh, resources for organized church life, you know. So these were common publications that were, you know, published by territorial churches in Germany, in Germany, and they were going to duplicate this here in this uh, Kirchenverein. Uh, so one was a common catechism, the Evangelische Katechismus. So a catechism is basically an outline of church doctrine and a guide to uh, belief in, in the church um, and was used for the training of youth, essentially, and for study by lay people. Um, they also created a book of, book of worship, which in, in German terminology is called an agenda, and a hymnal. Um, what else? Yeah. So I want to stop there a minute because now these are very important because, you know, you had German immigrants coming in from all over Germany, coming from different territorial churches, and they brought with them their own catechisms and their own uh, hymnals. So when you would try to get together as a congregation and sing, I mean, you, the pastor just couldn't stand up and say, let's sing hymn number 251 out of the hymnal because everybody, you know, everybody had a different hymnal and hymn 251 was different in every book. And so in order to have organized church life, everybody had to literally be singing out of the same book. And so it was very important to develop a common hymnal, which they did. Same thing with the catechism. I mean, catechisms and, and hymnals were, you know, oftentimes things that, that uh, immigrants brought with them, especially hymnals. Hymnals were very prized possessions. Um, but you had to have, you know, you, if you were going to teach the youth in the church, you had to be teaching out, out of the same book, you know, and... Uh, so they, these were very important uh, documents. So um, they also trained clergy. In the beginning, they tried to uh, you know, recruit young men to become pastors, um, and they tried to train them through, through tutelage. They would assign them to individual pastors and try to train them that way. Well, that wasn't working out very well. And so they decided that they really needed to open a seminary, which they did in June of 1850. So this is the predecessor of Eden Seminary, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It was founded in Marthasville, Missouri, or near Marthasville, Missouri. It was out in the country. And in 1850, it was really out in the country. It was founded out there, uh, a couple of reasons. One is, is that someone donated land for it, but also they didn't want to um, uh, found the seminary in St. Louis because they felt like, uh, the, the city environment would be too corrupting. So they wanted to be out there where in the fresh air and in the country and away from all the uh, evil influences of the city. Um, so um, there were parallel developments. I've been talking about the uh, German Evangelical Church Society of the West uh, that began in 1840, but there were parallel developments in other areas of the country. And I, I certainly want to mention this. Um, the Church Society of the West was the first to organize, but there was one called the United Evangelical Synod of the Northwest, which organized in 1844. They were centered around in Chicago and a lot of the churches in Northwest, uh, or I'm sorry, in Northern in Illinois um, and in Chicago belong to um, that, that denomination. Also in 1850, the German Evangelical Church Society of Ohio was organized. And then in 1854, the German Evangelical Synod of the East, which was also uh, covered parts of Ohio, was organized as well. So the uh, German Church, Evangelical Church Society of the West that was organized here in St. Louis in 1840 was the earliest. It was, I think, probably the most organized. It was one of the strongest. 
um, it had or organized early a seminary and some of these other uh, denominations would send their men to the uh, Marthasville Seminary to be trained uh, as well. Um, and they also would use some of the resources like the hymnal and the catechism and so on that the, um, uh, that the Church Society of the West had produced. So the Evangelical Church Society of the West was you know, the most organized and really kind of, the, in some ways, the strongest among these groups. Um, and so by 1860, I just kind of outlined where some of these groups were working. Of course, you have St. Louis. Buffalo was an area of activity, uh, Eastern Ohio down here in uh, <clears throat> Cincinnati and then Evansville, Evansville, there was some activity around there. And then of course, Chicago and around Milwaukee, oh, Iowa up here. So these were all areas that were heavily, uh, uh, where, where there was a lot of organizing going on for these uh, churches. So these groups began to merge between 1858 and 1871. Um, so after 1871, when they started getting organized, they changed, they adopted the name, the German Evangelical Synod of North America. So the uh, adoption of the term synod was finally a acknowledgement that they were a denomination. They were no longer just a kind of loose association. And by, by stating that they were the Evangelical Synod of North America, they were declaring that they were a national church, not just a regional church anymore. So by 1900, the membership of the churches and the number of pastors had doubled as it got organized. During this period, uh, the, the uh, the denomination really solidified its identity as a denomination and started creating some very strong organizations. And they strongly identified as a German speaking church. Now they, they definitely thought of themselves as an American church, but they were a German speaking American church. And they continued to affirm the religious position of its founders or the doctrinal position of its founders. That is a united church in uh, historical continuity with German Protestantism. They were strongest in the Midwest, but present wherever 19th century German immigrants settled. So you will find a lot of these churches um, in the St. Louis area, along the Missouri Rhineland, along the Missouri River, in Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, Chicago area, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, you know, <clears throat> areas where that had heavy concentrations of 19th century German immigrants. Texas as well. There were a number of churches in Texas, um, but they were present in other, you know, in other places, you know, in the East, um, where there were well-developed uh, Lutheran and Reformed denominations. They there were they were not as prevalent. Um, so, you, for example, in Philadelphia, you really don't find evangelical center congregations. In New York, you find a few. Um, in Washington DC there was one so in those eastern states they weren't there were not they didn't have a strong presence but definitely in the midwest and definitely where there was heavy 19th century german uh, immigration so in terms of their governing structure or their polity uh, they were divided the church was divided into geographical di districts and each had their elected officers president vice president secretary treasurer etc they had regular district and national conferences. Um, so um, you, can, you can really, uh, I think, characterize the denomination as being congregational with strong denominational leadership. So what I mean by that um, is that these conferences would, could make decisions and legislate you know, things, but they were only advisory to the congregations. They were you know, if for pastors, they were required, but for congregations, they were advisory. So congregations were very autonomous. They take care, took care of their own affairs. They, they owned their own property. They could hire and fire pastors as will, at will. Uh, most of them joined the denomination uh, formally, but many remained independent throughout the life of the Evangelical Synod. So uh, one of the, as you get later into the 19th century uh, and into the early 20th century, of course, the language question and assimilation becomes a very big issue. 
Um, German immigration peaked in 1892 and then declined sharply after that. Uh, the Evangelical Synod, like other uh, German Protestant denominations, had many parochial schools, um, but they were in decline by 1900. Um, especially in the Evangelical Synod, um, uh, uh, members, you know, it was always sometimes a struggle to keep a, a parochial school going. It was expensive to send your child to a parochial school, and um, and you know why send your, your your child to a parochial school when you can send your child to a public school for free, especially if they allow some German instruction. And so, parochial schools were on the decline by 1900. It was also always a challenge to find teachers for parochial schools. So pressure for English language services and publications began as early as the 1880s um, as children and grandchildren of immigrants came of age. And so, of course, you know, this desire for, for German language uh, church services and so on was very strong among the immigrant gener generation. But by the time you get down to the grandchildren, it's starting to wane a lot. And, uh, you know, the younger generation is more interested in what their English friends are doing, English speaking friends are doing, and so on. And so it's becoming an issue. So the um, denomination did try to respond a little bit. In 1874, it developed an English language liturgy in the Evangelical Book of Worship. However, it was really rarely used until it was revised in 1916. <clears throat> it developed an English language catechism in 1892. However, it was it was only published in German and English parallel. So the German and the English were side by side. Uh, they developed an, an English language hymnal, which was published in 1899. They had a, they had a German newspaper that was called Der Friedensbode that began in 1850. In uh, 1902, they started an English edition called The Messenger of Peace. And then uh, they did not start teaching theological classes in English at the seminary until 1908. So, you know, looming on the horizon was the crisis of World War I. And uh, of course, what that brought was anti-German sentiment. Uh, the Evangelical Synod, I mean, all the German Protestant churches uh, kind of suffered from, uh, from harassment or it was very common to suffer from harassment. Uh, um, at this time, but the Evangelical Synod in some ways uh, suffered more because it was often identified as the Kaiser's Church because <clears throat> the denomination over the years had, had sort of noted this kind of connection between, with, with some amount of pride between the Evangelical United Church of Prussia and their own denomination saying, you know, well, you know, our our United Church movement really began in Prussia and so on, even though there was no formal connection at all. Um, and so there were um, accusations that the evangelical synod congregations were part of the Kaiser's church. And actually there were a number of clergy who were imprisoned and deported during this period. Uh, of course, there were incidents of violence against property and person and that happened in uh, for uh, in other uh, German denominations as well. But the result of this was that, you know, there was already this transition into English and assimilation into the American context, and this just uh, accelerated the process. So at this time, also, there was a new generation of church leaders who were coming of age, and two very important ones were brothers Reinhold and H. Richard Niebuhr. H stands for Helmut, by the way. So um, they were both sons, uh, also of a German evangelical synod pastor. Um, their father, Gustav Niebuhr, had been a German immigrant himself. Uh, and Reinhold and H. Richard were uh, born in, um, in Wentz, let's see, I think they were born in Wentzville. Yes, Wentzville, Missouri. Um, so Reinhold was the uh, elder. He graduated from Eden in 1913. He went on to uh, become a professor, professor of theology uh, at Union Theological Seminary in New York. And then his brother H. Richard graduated in 1915 from Eden. He taught at Eden for a while. He was president of Elmhurst College, which I'll get to in a minute. 
um, but then taught uh, Christian ethics at uh, Yale. Um, so they became very prominent in the work of the denomination, kind of pushing a more uh, liberal agenda and an agenda to kind of get this denomination to uh, assimilate into the current, uh, American context more. Um, but they were also uh, also prominent and influential in, in American Protestantism, Protestantism in general, way beyond kind of their German Protestant roots. I mean, in these days, it's hard to think of a public theologian, but back in those days, they were there were what we what were known as public theologians who would who would write books who would write articles in pop in popular magazines and journals about theology and speak out on important issues and these two certainly did and sometimes in dialogue with each other so Reinhold Niebuhr especially was uh, he's a little more well known than his brother but you know it's hard kind of these days to think of a Protestant uh, theologian being on the cover of Time, but Reinhold Niebuhr was in March 8, 1948. And uh, so this kind of shows you how prominent uh, personalities that these were. And I will just mention that Reinhold Niebuhr is also credited with uh, composing the Serenity Prayer. I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with that. So um, he is uh, known for, for creating that as well. So, so they were two, but there were others in the denomination, including people who were beginning to teach at the seminary. But this group of new leaders, they just uh, believed that the denomination could not survive as an isolated ethnic German enclave, and it must develop out of that. And also, you know, through the life of the, of the Evangelical Synod, they, they, um, there was much, you know, pride in the fact that they were a united church, you know, albeit, you know, in most of its history, they considered themselves kind of united German Protestant, uniting German Lutherans and Reformed. But, you know, they took this logic further and said, hey, if we are really a united church, we should seek to unite with other denominations as well. So, um, this led to a shift away from a conservative German speaking, essentially Lutheran kind of uh, doctrinal outlook and ethos um, into a more uh, a mess, uh, a progressive American outlook. So especially these, these church leaders really wanted to more integrate this denomination more into mainline uh, American Protestantism. So um, there began to be some official transitions into English. In 1925, the president's report was read in English at the General Conference for the first time. And finally, in 1927, German was dropped from the denomination's name. So it had been known as the German Evangelical North America. And then in 1927, it just became the Evangelical Synod of North America. Um, not without controversy, by the way. There was a lot of debate within the denomination about that. Um, so in the congregations, as I mentioned, many congregations had begun the transition to English by World War I. So oftentimes this uh, sometimes started in the Sunday school. Um, eventually congregations would start to hold um, one English service a month alongside the, the German. And then eventually maybe they would, you know, have English every other week, sometimes in parallel with German and so on. But World War I really sped up this process. So um, by the end of World War I, you really had congregations really um, transitioning more completely into English. So you find more congregations having weekly English services. They may still have the, pa the parallel German service, but they would have weekly German services. Also, um, confirmation classes, and it was very controversial you know, about opening, about teaching confirmation in English and in some, for some, some congregations would have parallel classes, one in English, you know, one, one class would be in English and one would be in German for a while. But after World War I, this sped up um, so that by, you know, as we, as we get into the years after World War I, uh, English becomes less and less until English is only, you know, used, um, on special occasions, you know, for Christmas or Good Friday, so on. 
Um, so this push to assimilate uh, into the American context and into American mainline Protestantism um, led the, the denomination into the 20th century ecumenical movement. Um, it became an early member of the Federal Council of Churches in 1908. Um, that was a predecessor of today's National Councils of Churches of Christ. Um, and finally led to talks with other denominations. They, they tried different you know, dialogues with different denominations. Uh, but the one that seemed to uh, take was uh, dialogued with the Reformed Church in the US. So they merged in 1934 to become the uh, Evangelical and Reformed Church. So then, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the Evangelical Reformed Church merged with the Association of Congregational Christian Churches in 1957 to form the present day United Church of Christ. So by the time of its merger in 1934, the Evangelical Synod had just under 300,000 members, not a huge denomination. Uh, when it merged with the uh, uh, Reformed Church, it about doubled in size. So I want to just uh, highlight some of the institutions and missions that were created by this denomination, some of which persist into the into the day. So I've talked a little bit about the seminary. And as I mentioned, the seminary was founded in 1850. It was founded as the German Evangelical Preachers Seminary out in the country, out in the wilderness near Marthasville, Missouri. So this is a this photograph is a very early photograph. It's probably from around uh, 1854, 1855. I haven't been able to date it exactly, but uh, here you have the whole seminary community standing outside of the seminary building, with all their farm implements and the cattle, and so on. And in those days, uh, you uh, you know there some of the Catholic missionaries, uh, Catholic. Orders had the uh, slogan, Ora at, Ora at Labora, work and pray. And this was certainly the lifestyle of these early seminary um, students. They uh, had time each day for study, but then in the afternoon, they would have to get out the farm implements and uh, work the fields and milk the cows and so on, and then come back in and do some more work, study, and then sleep and get up and do it all over to get, again. So I happen, I have a, a seminary degree and, you know, when I was in seminary, we had field work, meaning that you went out and you did uh, some work in a local congregation or whatever. But I always said that these guys did real field work act, out in the actual fields. So by 1883, um, they decided that the Marthasville location was a bit too remote and they were beginning to outgrow their facilities. And so they purchased land in Wellston, which is just outside of St. Louis, and they built this grand building there and uh, uh, moved the seminary. And there, it was at this place that uh, the seminary gained the name Eden, or was first called the Eden Seminary. At first, it was just an informal name, and it was named that because it was near the Eden stop on the Wabash Railroad line. And the Eden stop itself was named after, I believe, uh, an Eden Methodist church that was near there at the time. So um, eventually Eden stuck and now it's known as Eden Seminary. In 1924, by 1924, the uh, Wellston location was deemed to be um, becoming problematic. Uh, it was becoming a more industrial and uh, more populated and you know all the dust and fumes were becoming uh, annoying and so they decided to move to a a leafy green uh, suburb which was webster groves uh, which was uh, just outside of st louis as well and they've been there since 1924. so elmhurst college was also a, an important institution it was founded in 1871 Elm, in elmhurst illinois just outside of chicago um, and it was founded as a pro-seminary. Well, what is a pro-seminary? Well, um, <clears throat> the Evangelical Synod, one of the, one of the challenges that it, it had for a long time was in training uh, seminary students, when they would receive these students, these students came from all kinds of 
uh, backgrounds, and many of them did not have much education. And so they decided that it would benefit them to create a, a pre-seminary institution that would allow them to you know, get these men up to speed so that they had a level of education um, that uh, would allow them to come to seminary and, and you know, kind of hit the ground running in terms of their theological study. Um, they would get the kind of the basic education out of the way. Also, as I mentioned, it was always a challenge to um, get parochial school teachers. There was a great demand for parochial school teachers. And, and this, these, the, the pro seminary could also be a place where <clears throat> parochial school teachers could be trained. So of course, parochial school, school teachers, they, they not only taught regular school subjects, uh, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but they also taught religion. And so they needed uh, some religious education as well. So Elmhurst College was created for that purpose. Uh, the Evangelical Synod had tried this before during the Civil War, and it didn't work because of the Civil War circumstances. And so they tried again in 1871. Elmhurst, Elmhurst College is still there. It's a liberal arts college, and it is still affiliated with the United Church of Christ. However, oh yes, so I wanted to mention, so it became a regular pattern that if you wanted, you know, if I was a, a member of the Evangelical Synod and I wanted to become a pastor, it was just assume that I would go to Elmhurst, I would spend two years at Elmhurst, and then I would go to Eden, and I would spend three years at Eden, and then I would become a pastor. And so it became, it, they developed this kind of phrase, you know, Elmhurst, Eden, and eternity, the three E's. So, but I did want to talk a little bit about the kind of the prehistory of Elmhurst, because it has an Evansville uh, connection. So, Actually, the Evangelical Synod or the Evangelical Synod predecessor opened a teacher seminary in Cincinnati in 1867. <clears throat> and then it was decided that they would move this to Evansville and make it a pro seminary with a teacher training department. So it was located in Evansville for a very short time. At that time, there was a merger with the United Evangelical Synod of the Northwest, which was centered in Chicago, and that led them uh, they had already tried to open up their own educational institution, so they decided to combine efforts. They moved it to Elmhurst and opened Elmhurst College in 1871. Okay, hey, um, the Evangelical Synod also opened many benevolent, benevolent, excuse me, benevolent institutions, meaning hospitals, orphanages, retirement homes. Also, Emmaus Home for Epileptics was a local institution, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, a good example of the kinds of, of institutions that they opened. You know, the kinds of institutions that provide, that they're, it's, uh, they're residential, they provide direct service, that kind of thing. Um, later, they started opening up inner city missions and settlement houses. Um, here in St. Louis, they opened up a, uh, a uh, inner city mission called uh, Caroline Mission, uh, which is still going under a different name. Um, which uh, provided like social services and that kind of thing. Um, they also created deaconess sisterhoods uh, beginning in 1889. And the deaconesses mainly were nurses and they established hospitals, although some served as parish workers and missionaries. So the first deaconess sisterhood or first deaconess uh, society was established here in St. Louis in 1889. St. Louis had its own deaconess hospital um, it closed in 2000 and uh, is no longer in, its, in existence. There's also a nursing school associated with it. And there you see a photograph of one of the deaconesses in their deaconess garb. Um, there was also, there's also a deaconess hospital in Evansville and it is also related to the Evangelical Synod and was also started by deaconesses, founded in 1892. Um, so there was also a home missions department in the Evangelical Synod, and it was a, a big effort. So uh, <clears throat> German immigration declined dur during the Civil War, but it rebounded very strongly afterwards, just at the time uh, that the Evangelical Synod was developing as a denomination. And so there was this huge push to establish churches for uh, these new uh, or these incoming German immigrants. It became a denominational focus. So they actually 
recruited pastors and seminary students from Germany. They had representatives in, in, in Germany who, who, who did recruiting. And there was even, um, there was even thought about starting a pro-seminary in Germany who would recruit Germans to uh, study there and then send them over to the United States to become pastors. That didn't happen, but they still did uh, recruitment there. They also had their own foreign missions. In 1884, they took over and established a German uh, evangelical mission uh, that had been started by a, a group of uh, different uh, German Protestant churches here in the United States. But the Evangelical Synod took it over part and parcel in 1884. Um, it was located in the central provinces of India. And there you see a photograph of some of the missionaries and some of the workers there at the um, mission. And then in 1920, they established a mission in Honduras, and that mission grew into a Protestant church that's uh, established there in Honduras now. So um, let's go back and revisit this question about how Lutheran this denomination was. Well, okay, so my background is Lutheran, and I went to a Lutheran seminary, and when I look at these congregations, they look Lutheran to me. They worship like Lutherans. Their church life was like Lutherans. They, they, their church customs were like Lutherans. And they, they believed like Lutheran, a lot like Lutherans. Um, when you start reading the literature, you see that the Lutheran, the Lutheran doctrine was re per, per, really preferred over reform document. So take the evangelical catechism, for example. The evangelical catechism shows a definite Lutheran imprint um, you know, some of it was modeled after Luther's catechism, although it was not word for word Luther's catechism, but, but the different points about, you know, what happens at Holy Communion and so on were more Lutheran. Um, the actual structure of the catechism was more reformed, uh, but the content was more Lutheran in many ways. Okay, so some churches identified themselves as Lutheran, and this can be very confusing. Why is this? So this happened, had, this occurred, um, well, for one thing, in early, in the early history of many churches, many churches would really try to figure out what they were, and some of them, they were founded by Lutheran immigrants, and so they called themselves Lutheran, and then other people, or other immigrants would come in, and then they would decide, well, we're not totally Lutheran, so maybe we change her name, whatever. But there were areas, especially like in the former uh, United Center of the Northwest, up around northern, northern Illinois and Chicago, all of the, almost all of those congregations up there identified themselves as Lutheran and had Lutheran in their names up until fairly recently. So for instance, as far as I know, they still, this, this is still true, there is an Eden Evangelical Lutheran United Church of Christ in Chicago. Um, all the congregations up there, almost all of them had Lutheran in their name. Same way in Texas. Uh, the congregations down there identify themselves as Lutheran, and yet they were served by these missionaries who came from this United Protestant background, and they joined the Evangelical Synod, and they were really United Protestant, even though they considered themselves Lutheran. It, it, it can be very confusing. Um, some members of the Evangelical Synod, some clergy in some parts of the church, actually advocated participating in the 1918 Lutheran merger that created the United Lutheran Church. So the United Lutheran Church is a predecessor of the present-day Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. There are two major Lutheran denominations in the United States. One is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is headquartered here in St. Louis. The other is the Evangelical Synod of North America, um, which is headquartered in, now in Chicago. Um, but anyway, there were some members of the Evangelical Synod who really felt Lutheran, strongly Lutheran, and Lutheran enough that said, hey, our denomination is really Lutheran, and we should really participate in this merger. And then some Lutherans looking from the outside in, like, you know, said, well, they look Lutheran to me. So the question was, can be posed, was it Lutheran? But ultimately, the answer has to be no, <clears throat> because throughout its history, 
the Evangelical Synod was adamant that it was a united Protestant denomination uh, adhering to both the Lutheran and Reformed doctrinal statements. As I mentioned, the Lutheran doctrine was preferred, but they were non-dogmatic. So opposing views were accommodated. Um, and there was no, there, within the denomination, it, it's remarkable, there were no dogmatic arguments, very few. Um, Whereas you, you, if you look at Lutheran denominations, you see all kinds of squabbles over doctrinal intricacies, you know, that divided them into, you know, fragmented Lutheranism in the 19th century into all kinds of denominations. That did not happen in the Evangelical Synod. They, they just totally avoided uh, theological argument wherever possible. It always represented itself as evangelical. And for them, this was a term for united, united Protestant. Um, and frankly, they would not have been accepted into the 1918 Lutheran merger by the Lutherans because the evangelical synod never would have given up its subscription to the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, I remember I said that they, they uh, adhered to three uh, German Protestant confessions of faith, the Augsburg Confession, which was Lutheran, Luther's Catechism, which was, of course, Lutheran, and the Heidelberg Catechism, which was Reformed. And they stood by that, and there was no way they were going to give that up. So that would not have been accepted by the Lutherans. But I will say, as I had mentioned, that this distinctive Lutheran character faded with its, the, the denomination's transition into English and the assimilization, assimilate, assimilation into American Protestantism. So looking back on it now, and kind of you know, working in this history, you could almost say that they were Lutheran by custom, if not by doctrine. <clears throat> so um, this brings us to some of the more pragmatic aspects of, uh, of this uh, presentation. And that, that's getting into kind of their church records, what kind of church records they produced and how you can kind of, how you can find them. So, you know, unsurprisingly, these congregations kept records like Lutheran congregations did. So if you are familiar or if you've ever done research on Lutheran records, then this will be very familiar to you. They, of course, kept records of uh, infant baptisms, confirmations, marriages, and burials. Also, you will find attendance records, like communion attendance records, membership lists, tithing records, minutes of the church council, and in various uh, congregational organizations. Um, so you'll find those as well. You know, one wonderful thing about German Protestant uh, records is that uh, women's maiden names, if they're married, are almost always mentioned. Um, marriage records especially can list places of birth, uh, especially in the earlier periods or in the earlier history of these congregations. These are very good sources of finding uh, the village of origin. Um, some congregations record information by family unit or kind of like a family group sheet. This was not universal, but I've got some examples. Um, so let's look at some examples of records. So these are early records. Uh, the earlier records were commonly um, kept in this kind of narrative format or this paragraph format. So this is a, a baptism from 1843 from the G German Evangelical Church in Highland, Illinois, which is near St. Louis. So let's take a, a look up or a closer look at this. So translated, this reads, born on March 26, 1843 and baptized on April 9th, 1843 was Anna Margareta, daughter of Mr. Jakob Kercher from Windesheim and his wife, Elisabeth Ne Grün from Brinsenheim, Koblenz District, Rhenish, Prussia. Godmother is Anna Margarita Kircher, and then it's signed by Joseph Rieger, who was the pastor. So lots of great information in that baptismal record. Okay, this is a marriage record from 1873 from St. Marcus Church here in St. Louis. Let's take a closer look. So this reads, Johann Georg Hall from Eckersdorf, district of Oberfranken, Bavaria, and Theresia Müller from St. Louis on, uh, married on 30th of November, 1873. Witnesses were Jakob Müller and Barbara Neibauer, parents of the bride, and then uh, signed by H. Broschler, who was the pastor. 
So, you know, full, full disclosure, this was my great grandparents. But there you see places of birth. And it, it lists uh, my great grandfather's place of birth. Actually, this was not his place of birth. This was the parish church he belonged to, but that's where the record is of uh, the family is held in uh, Eckersdorf. Uh, confirmation records this is one from 1873 from Zion Church, which is now Parkway United Church of Christ here in uh, St. Louis. Um, from 19. Oh, this is 19, no, I'm sorry, this is not 1873, this is 1906, that's an error. Uh, but essentially you have the name of the confirmand, the place of birth, uh, which is here, places in St. Louis County, Ferguson. But down here you say, you see in Germany. Um, and then birth date, confirmation date, and then some notes at the end. Um, um, so here's a, a record, and, and this is one of these family registers or family records, which I mentioned before. These are not universal, but some congregations did have them. So I'm going to show you an example. This is from, again, from Zion Church in De Pere, Missouri. Um, so it, um, yeah, so there, farther down in, in the middle of this sheet, you have the information about the parents, mother and father, where they were born, um, the year that the family joined the parish and the year that they left the parish. So this is sometimes helpful and, and you find this often, often uh, in Protestant church records, you will find these membership lists, you know, not so much in, in these German evangelical uh, congregations, but like Anglo-Saxon denominations like Methodists and Presbyterians, you have membership lists, wh which will show, you know, when the person joined the church and when the person left the church either by moving or by death or whatever. So here you have this and it can be helpful in, in locating a family in a certain place at a certain time. Um, so there below that you have information about the children. So you have their name, their birth dates, their baptismal dates, their confirmation dates. Probably, you know, you can see here that these children were, were confirmed before the family came into the parish. And uh, these were confirmed while they were at the parish and these were probably confirmed after they left or were not old enough yet by the time they left for confirmation. And then if any of them died, that would have been listed there as well. So, you know, nice record to find if, they, if the congregation has it. So a little bit about formats. Um, of course, you know, records were in German until the earliest early 20th century at least. Um, the records, you know, and when they were recorded in German, usually they were re recorded in the uh, German Handschrift. And if they were printed forms, then they would have been uh, printed in Fraktur, you know, in the headings and so on. Uh, the detail can vary depending on the congregation, the pastor who did the recording and the time period. There was no universal regulation about how congregations kept records, it was more by custom, and uh, it really depended on the recorder. Um, the introduction of printed forms helped standardize the kind of information that you would find in, the, in these records. Um, and then, in, in my experience anyway, as record, as the congregations transitioned into English and they started recording in English, they became, you know, that the record keeping suffered and became less detailed. So how do you find these records? Um, <clears throat> well, there is no central archives for the United Church of Christ. I will talk a little bit about archives that you will find within the denomination, but there's no central archives for uh, records. Each congregation can decide how to dispose of its records itself. There is no, there is no church law uh, deciding this. It, it's left up to the congregation. So they can keep their their records, they can give them to a local archives, they can send them to a denominational archives. Um, it's up to them. Um, many of the records have been uh, microfilmed for many of these congregations and consequently many of these records have now been digitized and they are on FamilySearch. So that is one place to go and look for them online. 
So uh, if you're looking for records, then I would, you know, my first suggestion is to contact the congregation, congregation directly if it's still in existence. Um, this may, might not be very straightforward, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you go about finding the congregation. So one thing, thing to take into consideration is the naming conventions <clears throat> that, that uh, have been employed in the course of a congregation's history. So um, you will find these congregations at various periods of time under different names. So for instance, a church called St. Paul's could start out as St. Paul's German Evangelical Church. It could have been St. Paul's German Evangelical Lutheran Church. It could have been St. Paul's German Evangelical Lutheran Reformed Church, St. Paul's German Evangelical United Lutheran Reformed Church, or St. Paul's German Evangelical Protestant Church. And you find these early, you know, early congregations or congregations in their early period in, in all kinds of, using all kinds of names like this. So that's one thing. And then there is the name change uh, that you see that depends on the denominational development. So a congregation may start out as St. Paul's German Evangelical Church up to the early 20th century. <clears throat> then it dropped German because they wanted to, you know, be less, seem less German. So then they just became St. Paul's Evangelical Church. And then when the, the denomination merged with the Reformed Church, it became St. Paul's Evangelical and Reformed Church. And then when it merged with the United Church of Christ, it could, have be, it could become St. Paul's United Church of Christ or St. Paul's Evangelical United Church of Christ. So that's another thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> also, you're dealing with, you know, churches that have saints' names and how those saints' names uh, translate into English. So Johannes is St. John, Jacob or Jacobus is St. James, Paulos is St. Paul, Mateus is St. Matthew, Marcus is St. Mark, Dreinikites is, is Trinity, uh, Friedens, it means peace, and Glaubens mean faith. Now, a lot of these, these congregations named Friedens kept the Friedens name. Some of them changed their name to peace, but you still see a lot of congregations that are called Friedens United Church of Christ. So, so you, you finally decide on the name of the congregation, but it's not where you think it should, it's not where you think it should be. You look there and it's not there. Well, why not? So you have to determine, did the congregation merge, move, or change its name completely? Um, so really, you may have to research the history of the congregation to find its present name and location. So I always say you may end up having to do the genealogy of the congregation um, in order to um, determine if it's the one that your ancestor belonged to. So then you may go through all this and find that the congregation has folded. So then what do you do? Well, so my suggestion is always to contact nearby UCC churches. It's uh, possible that, you know, the congregation merged in with another church or was absorbed by another local United Church of Christ congregation, and they might have the records or they might know something about it. Um, or you might contact the local UCC conference office. So the United Church of Christ is, is divided into geographical entities known as conferences, and they all have a conference office with a conference staff. So I suggest sometimes to people to check with the conference office. I have never known that to be successful, but I think it's something that you should do um, just in case. Um, and then uh, contact local libraries, historical societies, and university archives. These are typical places where congregations donate their records. And then finally, consider the denominational archives. Um, so like I mentioned, I am part-time archivist of Eden Theological Seminary archives. We are located at uh, Eden Theological Seminary, uh, logically. Um, and we have the archives of the Evangelical Synod denomination. We have the institutional records and we collect records for, the, for congregations. We do have a collection of uh, records of congregations we have about maybe records for maybe about uh, 250 congregations, mostly from Missouri and Southern Illinois, but from other places as well. Um, 
but we also maintained historical information about all congregations that were founded or related to the evangelical synod. So we keep historical files, um, we collect information, we collect printed histories and so on. So if you are having problems um, figuring out what congregation your ancestor belonged to or where the congregation could be or what happened to the congregation or where possibly the, the congregation's records went, you can contact me at the archives and I will try to help you uh, or at least give you some suggestions where to look. We also had uh, maintained biographical information uh, for clergy that, that served the denomination and for Eden Seminary graduates, which you know up until 1934 are one and the same. I mean, uh, the Eden Seminary was the only seminary for the denomination and almost 100% of the uh, graduates of Eden went on to serve congregations in the Evangelical Synod. So, but we have biographical information. So if you have an ancestor who was a pastor in the Evangelical Synod, I can probably give you a lot, at least basic biographical information and information about the congregations that uh, he served. Okay, there is another denominational archives um, that I will mention. That is the Evangelical Reformed Historical Society located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, that um, archives is the, they hold the records for the former Reformed Church in the US and that is what they collect. However, they do have records of some evangelical centered congregations, uh, mainly from Eastern states. Um, so that would be another place to check potentially. You might, um, you know, if you contact them, you can talk to them and they might refer you back to me. But uh, I just want to mention that. And they do have a website. It's erhistoricalsocietyoneword.org. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. And I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Hopefully you, you know, have some there in the um, chat or in the Q&A. So um, Kelly, do you want to look at that and see what we got? Sure, we have a question from Kent. Um, he says, you indicated that Saxony was Lutheran. Does that apply to both the Kingdom of Saxony and the Prussian province of Saxony? Um, I believe the Prussian province of Saxony was united. Um, you know, don't hold me to that, but that, you know, in my recollection, that's true. I think that the Prussian province of Saxony included Anhalt and that was a united church. Um, that's the only question we have so far, unless anyone has any additional questions. Yeah, so this is your chance. If you have any questions, feel free to post them there in the Q&A or, you know. Um, uh, Bob asked, where do I find St. Marcus Church records circa 1880? Uh, we have the original record, uh, St. Marcus and St. Louis. Uh, we have the original records at the archives at Eden. We also have microfilm copies here at St. Louis County Library. So if you need us, need a lookup, contact us here at the library and we can do it for you. And a question from Diana. She says, I missed the slide with the email address of the reformed archives, the one in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'll put that slide back up for a minute. Okay, and uh, another one, my great grandparents are in uh, Femi Osage, Missouri in 1870 and likely UCC members. Can you expound on the church membership at that time? Yeah, so yeah, the Femi Osage church is um, an interesting case. So when, you know, going back to the 1830s and we have to go back to 1833 when that congregation was established. So 1833, this is before the missionary started to arrive. And it was at the beginning of when a lot of the German immigrants started coming in. Well, there was a group of immigrants from Tecklenburg who settled in the, in the Femi Osage area. And uh, of course they got there and there was no church. Well, there was a gentleman whose name was um, um, Herman Garlix who happened to be there. He was a German, he was a German. He was from the middle class. And so there was only, okay. So let, let's talk a little bit about who immigrated to the United States. 
um, the majority of 19th century immigrants and probably 18th century immigrants as well, as well to the United States were, were peasant farmers or craftsmen. You know, they were seeking freedom, economic opportunity, or so on. They were living in, you know, um, um, almost literal serfdom in, in Germany and coming to America was their chance to improve economically and to have improved socially, have more freedom and so on. So that's why they came here. So if you were, you know, in the middle class, if you were of means or if you were of middle class or above in Germany, there was no real need for you to come to the United States. If you were in the middle class and you came to Germany, it was one, because you wanted to open up a business and make money, and there were those that, that did that, or you came here for adventure. And there were a number of, of, uh, of people who came here sh purely for the adventure of doing so. Well, Herman Garlicks, he was university trained. He what, had sort of entered the civil service in Germany, and he came over to Missouri for adventure. He wanted to come over, he wanted to explore the frontier, he wanted to farm and see what that was like. So he came over here, he bought a farm, and he had servants um, to do the farming for him so he could kind of go off and you know, explore whatever. He went back and he married someone and brought her over here who must have thought, what have I gotten myself into? But uh, so anyway, he was living near Femi Osage as well. So these Tecklenburger immigrants uh, living there saw this guy and said, oh, you know, they went to him and said, oh, well, you've got a university education. Do you think you could be our pastor? And he said, okay, I can do that. So he, he started um, preaching for them and, you know, becoming their pastor. And eventually he did go back to Germany. He became ordained. And then later he connected with the Evangelical Synod. And uh, so this congregation was a member of the Evangelical Synod, even though it predates, you know, these missionaries coming in and certainly predates the founding of the Evangelical Synod. In fact, the Femi Osage congregation, which is still in existence, um, is um, the earliest German reformed, or I'm sorry, German Protestant congregation west of the Mississippi. Um, Herman Garlake's uh, eventually went on and became a pastor in New York City, had a church in Brooklyn. Um, so anyway, that's the background on the Femi Osage Church. So yes, uh, it was part of the Evangelical Synod and is now part of the United Church of Christ. I have a few more questions. Uh, one from Leslie. My ancestors were Lutherans in Texas. Is there an archive that serves that area? Well, of course, you have to determine if they were Lutheran or if they were Evangelical Synod or something else. But um, if they were Evangelical Synod, um, you know, their records, I would, you know, like I said, the first thing to do would be check with the congregation if it's still in existence. If the congregation is not in existence, then, you know, check with local, other local UCC congregations or the conference office. There is no central archives down there. The Lutheran Archives is at uh, uh, Texas Lutheran University. Um, and I, I can't tell you what the address of it is, that is right now, but that's where the, the Texas Lutheran Archives are. Um, but if you need help, if you need help determining uh, what the church was or where the, where the records could be, might be located, please contact me and I'll try to help you figure that out. And another question from Karen. Do you have any thoughts on why so many evangelical congregations have the name St. John or St. John's? Well, you know, St. John was a common name, not just in the evangelical synod, but among Lutheran congregations as well. And I think uh, it goes back to um, the fact that the Gospel of John was very much, I think, beloved in Lutheran circles. And, and so that, you know, they just, they named their, their churches after St. John the Evangelist. I mean, I don't know, you know, that's my own thought. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a, you know, source I can point you to and say that's the reason. But, you know, St. Paul, St. John certainly uh, was common. St. Paul's was another one that was very common, um, you know, because St. Paul, of course, was very important uh, uh, 
for in Lutheran theology and Pauline theology was very important for in Lutheran theology as well. So. And another, uh, Janet asked if you could tell me more about the deaconesses. Yeah, deaconesses are really interesting. Um, so you know, I could do I could do a whole program on the deaconesses, um, but to you know give you the the nickel version. Um, the Deaconess move was a Deaconess move. Deaconess were a movement. It started in Germany. It started in Kaiserswerth, which is in the Rhineland area, <clears throat> I believe, in Westphalia. And um, there was a pastor there. And uh, at that time, this is early 19th century, and Germany was industrializing. And it, the industrialization was causing a, a huge amount of social change and economic hardship for many people. And uh, he looked around and said, we got to do something about this. And so he uh, started creating institutions that could aid people, um, you know, provide aid. So he opened an orphanage he, uh, and he created a deaconess uh, order or deaconess sisterhood. So the idea behind this, and it was it was modeled after the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, who operated in France beginning in the 16th century. So it was it was kind of modeled, modeled after Catholic this Catholic order. What set that Catholic order apart from others at that period of time was it was the first order of women that was not cloistered. Uh, the sisters and the Saint, the Daughters of Charity. You know, their mission was to serve the poor. They left the convent, went out to the streets and ministered to poor people outside of the convent. So this idea was adopted for the German deaconesses and there was a German deaconess hood and the, there's still a large deaconess community there in Kaiserswerk. Um, so their idea was, you know, women, uh, un unmarried women living in community and working mostly as nurses. Um, and the, the, the Kaiser's fair deaconesses um, were notable in that they, they really modernized the profession of nursing. I mean, they developed, you know, nursing techniques and so on that, that have come up through into modern times. In fact, um, um, uh, the founder of the Red Cross, whose name I can't recall right now, um, she uh, studied with the Kaiser's Fair Deaconesses and brought those ideas of nursing and those techniques of nursing to England. And uh, that's, you know, so the, the Kaiser's Fair Deaconesses were very influential. Okay, so this was established in Germany and in, in the United States, German Protestants of all stripes were very intrigued with this idea. So the Lutherans were the earliest to, to latch onto this idea. And there were deaconess communities founded in the Lutheran church early um, in the earlier 18, in the earlier 19th century. Um, and there was a, a long standing uh, deaconess house in Philadelphia. Um, there are still deaconesses in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. There are deaconesses in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod as well. But the Evangelical Synod also adopted this idea and created these deaconesses. Uh, deaconesses could also be found in other, in, Lutheran, in other German Protestant denominations. The Methodists had German, uh, German had developed German uh, congregations. So there was a whole conference that was German Methodist. And within that conference, there were German deaconesses. Um, there were German, you know, it, it, there were other places as well. There were German, there were proud, there were Mennonite deaconesses as well. But this was an idea that was adapted by many German Protestants. It was very strong in, in the Lutheran church and in the Evangelical Synod as well. So there are no more deaconesses in, in the uh, United Church of Christ. I mean, unless there are, there are very modern ones that have developed recently. Um, what happened was that it, the, the turning point kind of came at the time of the merger with the Reformed Church. So the, the, the first deaconess society in the Evangelical Synod was founded in 1889, as I mentioned here in St. Louis. It spread to other areas. There were other deaconess hospitals and other societies around the country. Um, but 
you know, the deaconesses and their hospitals and other benevolent institutions and the seminary were highly, highly supported and valued by the members of the Evangelical Synod. And they really, really supported them. They were beloved institutions. When the Evangelical Synod merged with the Reformed Church, the Reformed Church had a few deaconesses, but did not have these, these larger deaconess communities like the Evangelical Synod did. And the, the Evangelical Synod, the deaconesses were, they were considered quasi clerical. I mean, they, they were considered kind of at the level of a, of a deacon. I mean, they, they weren't ordained like a pastor, but they were consecrated. So they had a consecrated, uh, consecrated ministry within the Evangelical Synod. Um, in the Reformed Church, this consecrated ministry was not recognized. And so the denominational support kind of disappeared for the deaconesses and they, 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 it took, they worked for years to try to get the Evangelical Reformed Church to recognize their ministry as a consecrated ministry within the denomination. And they were, I think they finally succeeded in the 1950s, which was too late. So that was one, one factor. The second factor had to do, you know, and it, it, it's a factor that has led to the decline of, of, uh, women's orders within uh, the Catholic Church. You know, as in the 20th century, as women had, had more uh, opportunity, they, you know, they went elsewhere and sought other opportunities. You know, I mean, at the time that the <clears throat> Evangelical Deaconesses was found, was found in 1889, women depended almost totally on a male. I mean, you had to be married or you had to live with a, a male who could support you. I mean, the idea of a woman working outside the home was, was especially in German American circles, was just unheard of. Um, and uh, German, you know, culture was very patriarchal, of course, as, as well. And so, you know, the, the, these deaconess societies provided a, a, a way that women, women had an alternative. Women could join these orders and have a career as a nurse outside of the control of men, even though, you know, that these hospitals were, had their, uh, the administrators were almost always men. Um, but, but within their orders, they governed them, pretty much governed themselves. And so, you know, as women had other opportunities, they went elsewhere. And what was happening in the evangelical synod, at least at, at, in the society here in St. Louis, is that, that by the 1930s, women you know, when you joined the, when the, you joined the deaconesses, you were trained as a nurse. And so then when you graduated, you were consecrated and you became a deaconess and you worked as a, a nurse in one of the hospitals. Beginning in the 1930s, women would come in, they would uh, become probationary members of the order. They would get trained as a nurse, they would graduate, and then they would leave the order and go work at another hospital. So, uh, in order to preserve their, the integrity of their order, the evangelical deaconesses uh, created or, or set up a nursing school so that, they, so that women who did not intend to become deaconesses could come in, get trained as nurses, and so on. But that really led to the decline in the number of deaconesses. And by the last deaconess here in St. Louis, anyway, was was consecrated in 1948, I think, and then the, the order just gradually died out. The last deaconess here in St. Louis died at the age of 107 and was still living in the deaconess home that was adjacent to the hospital. She died in around 1910, or 2010 rather, I think. So anyway, that's, that, that's more probably than you want to know, but that's kind of an overview. Okay, we had another question. Are the records for UCC and Herman digitized? The records for the UCC in Herman? Yes. Sorry, St. Paul's and Herman? I don't know. Um, I you, you would just need to check the, the family search website and check their catalog. Okay, and uh, Karen wanted to let you know that uh, Willard Library in Evansville has the records of many churches. Okay, that was the Willard Library? Yes. That is good to know. <laughs>
Um, and then, um, let's see. Um, was there any, ever any overlap between the German Lutherans and the Scandinavian, and in parentheses, Norwegian Lutherans? Okay, so that's a Lutheran question. So um, the short answer is yes. Um, so um, there was in the 19th century, um, a develop, there developed an organization that was called the Synodical, the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference. And it was a, a composed of denominations, Lutheran denominations that uh, were conservative, uh, confessional, orthodox, came more out of this kind of old Lutheran movement. Missouri Synod was a member, um, or the Missouri Synod as it looked at that time was a member. There was a Synod in Ohio that was a member and there was a the Norwegian Synod was a member of that. And the Norwegian Synod, Synod actually um, sent its students to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis for its training. Um, so there was that kind of overlap and, and um, eventually um, there was a split in the, in the Norwegian church. Some of them remained in the, in the Synodical Conference, some of them did not. And some of those that remained in the Synodical Conference it, uh, eventually joined the Missouri Synod, I re as I recall. But anyway, so there is that connection. Um, so uh, there was more of a relationship with the Synodical Conference and with the Missouri Synod with some of these more conservative Scandinavian groups like this Norwegian group. There was a small D Danish group as well. Um, so that's kind of the connection. You know, I mean, there were there was this connection that some of them agreed do, uh, dogmatically and theologically with each other, and so they had more of a relationship. Okay, and uh, Talia asks, can you please speak to the immigrants that came to Perryville County, Missouri, uh, and in, in parentheses Altenburg? Were they old Lutherans or reformed Lutherans? I'm related to CFW Walther and many Weinhold and Vogel pa pastors. Well, if, if you're a if you're from if you're a <laughs> If you're a Lutheran from Perry County, I can guarantee you come out of old Lutheran stock. So when when this this emigration from <coughs> Saxony in 1839, their goal was Perry County, Missouri. So they were old Lutherans uh, led by Martin Stefan. Martin Stefan was deposed for reasons I won't go into. When they got here, C.F.W. Walther became their leader, and uh, some of them stayed here in St. Louis, but the rest of them went down to into Perry County. And Perry County is where, uh, where Concordia Seminary was originally founded, later it was moved to St. Louis. But yes, I mean, the Lutherans in Perry County were definitely old Lutheran, conservative, Orthodox Lutherans. Okay, and Sandy has a question. She, she asked if you have any suggestions for information on identifying Lutheran pastors in Western Iowa or Eastern Nebraska. Um, if you have specific questions about, you know, if you have specific names, I can tell you if they were evangelical Senate or not. So please contact me. Okay. Otherwise, if they're Lutheran, they'd want to contact Concordia. Uh, well, if they're Lutheran, okay. If, if they were Lutheran, then the, then the task becomes more complex because, you know, if they were Lutheran, what kind of Lutheran were they? Were they a Lutheran that ended up in the Missouri Synod? Or were they a Lutheran that ended up in what's now the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America? So, you know, um, <clears throat> there was um, a conservative Lutheran denomination that was called the Iowa Synod. And uh, the Iowa Synod was, uh, it was, it was not, I'm trying to recall if it was a member of the Synodical Conference or not, but it was pretty conservative. Um, but you know, if, if they were in the Iowa Synod, which served, of course, Iowa and areas around there, then likely they ended up in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, the Iowa Synod archives ended up at Wartburg Seminary, I believe, but the central archives for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is in Chicago. So, you know, you just have to, you'd have to inquire. I would, I would start by inquiring with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America archives. Okay. 
Okay, and uh, Talia had a question. It says, there was a beautiful Lutheran church in St. Louis, North County by the name of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. It was demolished about seven years ago. Was it founded under the old Lutheran ways or reform Lutheran ways? Where can I find that information? I think you mean Beth Bethlehem Lutheran Church that's in North City, um, which, yeah, I mean, they did raise most of it. Um, that congregation is still active, actually. I think, Kelly, maybe you can tell me that we, do we have Bethlehem records on microfilm here at the library? Uh, let me double check. I thought that we did. I think we do. I think we have records. But anyway, it was a Missouri, it, it is a Missouri Synod Church. It was founded by the Saxon Lutherans. Uh, when the Saxon Lutherans came here, Trinity Lutheran was the kind of the mother church. In fact, it's considered the mother church of the Missouri Synod. Uh, still, you know, strong congregation still uh, in inner city St. Louis. Um, uh, but there were four original congregations. After Trinity, there were three others that became kind of the, the early uh, kind of pioneer churches in St. Louis that Bethlehem was one. Uh, you have the microfilm. Okay, so if you need to look up, you know, please contact us and we can look up in Bethlehem records. But Trinity, Bethlehem, Holy Cross, and Z uh, Zion were kind of the four pioneer congregations in St. Louis of the Missouri Senate. Um, let's see, another one uh, from John. It says, do you have any idea how the music of the early United Church in Prussia was organized? Typically Calvinist churches were bare bones while Lutheran music was very rich. Well, I mean, th this is a, the difference, I mean, that stems out of, <clears throat> stems out of um, both uh, theology and ethos, I call, I say between the Reformed and the Lutheran. Uh, one of the main differences between the Reformed and the Lutheran was the, rep, the Luther, their attitude towards the, the, well, the, the types of reforms that needed to be instituted. <clears throat> so the Lutheran reformers and Luther himself kind of looked at the Catholic church and said, okay, we don't have to throw the baby out with the bath water. So let's, you know, whatever we can keep from our Catholic practice, and traditions let's keep as long as they do not go against you know the gospel you know evangelical practice so consequently lutherans you know retained the mass meaning they retain the traditional liturgy they retain the church here they retain vestments you know the churches with the altars and the stained glass and the imagery the statues and so on you know, they might have removed some of the statues of the saints because, you know, they, Lutherans don't pray to saints or venerate saints, um, especially in those days. But, but you know, you know, you, you know, you could, if you were Catholic and the Lutheran Reformation came to your town, you could go to church and not that much changed. You know, the, the, the service might be in German now instead of Latin or parts of the service may be in German now, instead of Latin. The readings from the Bible, scriptural readings for the week would probably be in German, and the sermon would probably be, would be in German. Parts of the liturgy might be in Latin. So, and of course, music was a big part of that. And, you know, if you are a Lutheran, you know, Lutherans have always been known as the singing church, and, you know, Lutherans have a very rich tra uh, tradition of, of hymnody and liturgy, uh, and, uh, church music, Bach, of course, was Lutheran, and so on. So a very rich heritage there. Okay, on the reform side, the attitude was totally different. So the attitude was, we are going to base our, we think Christianity, should, Christianity, Christian practice and belief should only be based on the Bible strictly. So if it's not in the Bible, then we shouldn't practice it. So, you know, so therefore, it's like, well, stained glass isn't in the Bible, so we can't have stained glass. So they ripped out the stained glass. And of course, imagery, you know, the Old, the old Testament uh, prohibition against images of God. So you can't have images. So all those were removed. And so the churches were absolutely stripped. And if you, you can see this happening in England, which went back and forth in, in their, in the English Reformation, but you know, where, you know, suddenly the, the church would become more reformed and, and people would go in, rush into the churches and absolutely strip everything out of the churches. And so that's why, you know, everything is very spare. The church 
environment is very spare. There's no imagery. Um, I don't know what the practice in, in Prussia was at the time we're talking about, but at the beginning of the Reformation, there was no instrumental music in Reformed churches. And the only uh, singing, there was congregational singing, but only uh, psalms or metrical psalms and only a cappella. So yes, I mean, there was a definite difference between the Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church in, in these sorts of ways. Um, some of the questions are more specific. I don't know if you want to have people email the questions or we can go, go through. Uh, one is about Femi Osage. Uh, he asks, is it Tecklenburg or Mecklenburg, Germany? I'm not sure if that's the... Uh... Tecklenburg. Tecklenburg, okay. So that's north, north uh, Western. Okay. Um, let's see, I think we may have just about covered. Uh, one more from Talio it says, when did it become tradition in American Lutheran churches to use lots of orchestral instruments and rich arrangements for high holly, hol holy days, excuse me, like Christmas and Easter? I understand J.S. Bach made that a, a big tradition in Germany. Did it carry over immediately for the German immigrants? Um, yeah, so J.S. Bach, what he did was he composed a cantata for every Sunday in the church, Sunday and festival of the church year. And these would be uh, um, played in church on Sunday in uh, Leipzig, for instance, where he was a cantor for many years. So, you know, they would do the regular liturgy, but then in place of, or, or in the middle, you know, after the sermon or maybe in place of the sermon, sometimes they would have this cantata. And the cantata was, you know, based on the gospel reading for that Sunday. And there was musical arrangements and orchestra. Well, sometimes an orchestra, but certainly organ and choir and all that kind of thing. So the, this, you know, this tradition, this rich musical tradition was certainly brought over by the, the German immigrants. Now, how it was practiced in the United States, I mean, you would not find that I know of in a Lutheran church on any typical Sunday for orchestration or anything like that, but you would certainly find a choir and you would certainly find an organ. And um, sometimes, you know, these cantatas would be put on as a special thing. Um, I know that, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the church in Chicago, Grace Lutheran Church in River Forest, um, has a tradition of presenting, the, uh, I, you know, these cantatas, or they used to, I don't know if they still do, um, at least one Sunday a month, they have pre present one of these cantatas. You know, they're done on special occasions. But certainly this musical uh, music uh, heritage and these musical traditions were brought by the, the Lutheran um, immigrants. And you can find this in the Evangelical Synod as well. Okay, and then another question says also, I guess he has relatives in Iron County and members of Emanuel Evangelical Church can't find their home village, maybe Wurttemberg or Frankfurt. Any ideas? I would say just research the church records, <clears throat> see if it's mentioned. Um, you know, the finding the immigrant uh, place of origin is, you know, it, it can be challenging. And uh, I just tell people you have to look at every available record in the U.S that you can find, because you, you never know what the, where this information is going to be. It can be an obituary, it can be in a will, it can be in a church record, it can be in a letter, family letter, it can be, you know, uh, it can be mentioned anywhere. So you just need to, to do, you know, thorough U.S. research and certainly truck it, you know, certainly if your ancestors were from that congregation, you need to thoroughly investigate those church records. Also, I will, um, let's see. Emmanuel in Iron County. There is a series of books by Roger Minert called German Immigrants and American Church Records. And there is a volume from Missouri. You might check there, see if that church um, is included. And Yolanda wanted to, uh, to let us know that the Randolph County, Illinois Genealogical Society has transcribed and published the evangelical church records in their county. Randolph. Illinois? Yes. Genealogical Society? Yes. I'm sorry, they, they have transcribed? 
Yes, they've transcribed and published the evangelical church records in oh. their country. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to check and see if we have those. If not, we need to get a copy. Or I would like us to get a copy. <laughs> okay, I think that uh, covers everything. Well, we're, we're getting close to nine o'clock and, and that's my quitting time. So, um, <laughs> gee, you know, this was you know, great questions. You know, I so enjoyed you know, presenting this to you and um, hope you got something out of it. You know, if you do have questions, let me go back to um, my closing slide. Um, you know, please feel free to contact us. You know, if you have any questions and we'll certainly try to help you, please check out our website. We have a lot of information on our website, not just about St. Louis genealogy, but uh, other things as well. And uh, you know, feel free to call us or email us to, to even if you just have general questions or you just need help with your genealogical research, we can certainly give you some advice. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Kelly, why don't you go ahead and, and wrap us up? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. Uh, if you have any further questions or comments, we have the slide up, but uh, you can call us at 314-994-3300 or email us at genealogy at slcl.org. If you're watching this live, I recommend that this class, I remind you, I'm sorry, that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org slash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment below. This ends the webinar. Have a good evening.